Hey, and welcome back everyone to our weekly Rust and Orboot hacking streams. So I gotta excuse myself for today a bit. Um, you might hear it, I've got a bit of a sore throat. I hope I haven't uh, caught the virus, but um, yeah, we will see. Um, I haven't tested yet, so anyway. Uh, long story short, um, I will also try to keep the stream a bit shorter today, let's say like 45 minutes maybe, um, and let's dive right into it. So today I want to talk about the Rust Embedded Hell, and I've already opened the corresponding documentation website from the Rust Embedded book, and what the Embedded Hell is, and how we're using it in our boot, is a topic for actually a bit later, because first up we've got some news. So as you can see in my browser, I've already got a few tabs open besides this one here. Um, and let's actually start on the very left here. So first of all, as you know, I'm doing this here uh, as part of the RISC-V dev board program, um, which is also uh, what we're seeing here, because there is going to be a next round of this uh, program. So yeah, Jeff Scheel, who is organizing this, uh, has announced the relaunch here. Um, just a while ago, so you see September 21. Um, and besides the DevBot program itself, um, there is also a meeting, a bi-weekly meeting, uh, for the different companies, the chip vendors and so on. Um, and that appears to be every two weeks. Uh, he was writing this week is a meeting that was on September 22 then, so 20, 21st was actually the Wednesday, 22nd was the Thursday, which means tomorrow, um, October 6th, uh, will be another one of those meetings. Um, yeah, anyway, if you want to check this out, uh, go look here in the RISC-V.org Dev Board Community Google Group. Now, uh, there is also another uh, website where you can check this out. There is this announcement here in the blog, and that has actually just been posted uh, two, uh, two days ago on Monday, um, yeah, with a, with a bunch of uh, more explanations also. Um, I think they've allocated quite a bunch. Yeah, they're saying uh, we're, we've given aw away 163 boards. I think that's what so far has been given away. And then there is uh, a bunch more. So yeah, if you want a board, you want to participate in that program, uh, definitely go check this out. So that's on risk5.org in the blog, um, and I will also put the link here again in the notes later. Now there is a uh, second uh, Google group here, and that's this one. And I think that's actually where uh, they're planning with the board vendors uh, and chip suppliers and so on. But I'm not too sure, sure yet. I just uh, <laughs> requested to join this group here myself. Um, yeah, I, I will have a look at that as well. Now. Another thing from RISC-V is this year. So, uh, you know, uh, the RISC-V, uh, let's say the, the whole organization around RISC-V International uh, consists of different communities, members, um, and different, uh, I don't know, working groups, steering groups, whatever. Um, and now there is an election going on for one of them, uh, where, I've, uh, also, where I've also voted. And this year is about, um, Good question, actually, I forgot. Anyway, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's looking quite promising. They have quite some interesting candidates uh, who have, uh, you know, backgrounds with um, actually a lot of time spent in different projects. Uh, and they also have their different specialties, so to say. Um, and I found very interesting uh, Nick Kosofidis here uh, being involved in the European Processor Initiative, EPI. So yeah. Um, Let's see uh, what will come out of this. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm very excited to see uh, a lot of things going on here and actually having these elections. So, you know, we can also, from the RISC-V community, uh, we can actually influence a bit uh, where the project is going, right? So, yeah, it's a bit like uh, in, a democratic, uh, in a democratic state where, you know, people can actually vote. Uh, <laughs> really nice to see this year. I'm, I'm sorry, it's actually not very funny because there are some regimes where, uh, you know, things are going quite wrong right now. But let's not derail too much. Um, another event happened, OSFC, I told you I've been there, uh, and they have just published the talk. So if you go to osfc.io slash 2022 slash schedule, 
uh, you will see that um, in the talk descriptions, there are links now. So let me just scroll down. I already uh, clicked on Wednesday here. And uh, let's see this one here. That's the Orboot status report I gave. Um, so yeah, here you can see uh, we got the video here. You can just click and play it. And yeah, I will also uh, put the link to the uh, OSFC website again in the notes. And so with that, let's finally get back to this topic here, uh, Embedded Hell. So um, if you recall, you've been following the streams here, uh, then you know that we actually shifted the driver model um, in the Orboot project from being uh, something um, that, that we had uh, sort of created ourselves, um, which was very much leaning against the model from the Plan 9 operating system. Um, and well, I have proposed, and that's for a bunch of reasons that uh, we could actually shift over to the embedded HAL model here, um, which is essentially, uh, you know, a specific, uh, specific interface or interfaces for uh, the different common peripherals that you find in uh, different systems. Um, so HAL, uh, just uh, to resolve the abbreviation, it's an acronym short for hardware abstraction layer. Uh, and that's actually a very, very common thing. So also in uh, different operating systems, you also find this. Um, in FreeBSD, for example, there was, uh, I don't know about the current state, but there was a HAL D uh, daemon for doing hardware abstraction layers. I don't know exactly how that worked, but um, <laughs> I know I've seen it definitely. Um, and you also find that in a bunch of other places. Of course, there is also something here on uh, Wikipedia which is what they are citing from. So how do we do this in Rust? So, well, there is, first of all, a crate, uh, which is called the embedded hell crate. And that embedded hell crate gives us a bunch of traits. So traits, uh, you know, essentially define the um, different uh, sort of uh, entities that we have and methods to implement for them. So yeah, they are describing the layering here. And at the very bottom, they're starting with the microcontroller. And if you think about it, um, so this here being for the uh, Rust embedded group or from the Rust embedded group, it makes sense that they are looking uh, mostly at microcontrollers. So uh, but we're actually more uh, interested in application processors or microprocessors. So the essential difference is microcontroller is mostly tightly, very integrated, a very special purpose thing. Um, that's at least a traditional definition. Um, and it, you know, it has some integrated uh, storage and so on, like, a, you know, flash storage uh, that you can write to for uh, deploying your firmware. Um, it doesn't have an MMU, a memory management unit. And that's what we have with our modern SOCs and we've been having with processors for quite a bunch of time. So. Um, if you want to have a general purpose operating system like Linux running or FreeBSD or, you know, Illumos or Plan 9, you name it, or the alternative ones like macOS or Windows, um, then you would actually have an MMU, a memory management unit. So it's slightly different uh, in that regard, but that's not what we're touching here anyway. This year is really just about the peripheral drivers. And, well, a memory controller is also a peripheral, uh, but let's just put that one thing aside here and look at everything else because what you find here with microcontrollers is also exactly the same stuff that you also find uh, with the application processors uh, and then SOCs, which you know just have those peripheral uh, uh, parts integrated. So what they define is something they call a PAC, P-A-C, or peripheral access crate. And that is exactly the implementation for a specific microcontroller using the traits coming from embedded hell. So with that, you can now take a, uh, you can now take the hardware abstraction layer and implement your own driver on top of that. So this is like essentially all the definitions of registers or register blocks sometimes the specific bits that you can write to those registers or maybe just read and so on. And so, uh, yeah, that's, um, that's a, a bit of a, let's say, decoupled concept. But we're now focusing on this here, 
the hardware abstraction layer, impl. It says impl, impl short for implementation. And well, how do you implement this? As I said, there are these traits which are in, in this gray box here. I'm not exactly sure uh, if this is a perfect diagram for showing this, uh, but anyway. Um, now, besides the peripheral access crate, they also define another crate, which is the board support crate. And the idea of the board support crate is that for a given microcontroller, um, which is sitting on a specific board, uh, you would actually have a purpose for each of the peripherals that are integrated there. Like for example, GPIOs, they get a specific meaning. So for example, you can have an LED on the board somewhere and the LED is attached to a very specific GPIO. So you could technically use that GPIO for anything if you just have the bare pin. But if you have an LED there, for example, it doesn't really make sense, for example, to use it as an input, right? So you can just use the LED as an output and then, I don't know, uh, use PWM, for example, to have different uh, levels of brightness or, you know, d depending on the LED, of course, it can be a multicolor LED or whatever. Uh, it doesn't really matter here, but what I'm saying is this is now a specific uh, use of that um, microcontroller. And so there is the idea of having a board support crate. Now, if you have done this here before, but in a C world, you might know the term board support package. So that is a very specific term um, describing essentially the same idea, uh, just a bit in a more uh, general concept. So with a board support package, um, that's how chip vendors and board vendors supply, you know, a pre-packaged environment with all the drivers and header files and also the uh, often the tool chains and so on, uh, so that you can use them right away. Um, now, this here is actually going in a direction I personally uh, favor a lot more. So uh, the problem with the board support packages is usually they are based on, you know, some older frozen release, whatever. And often the tool chains are also something rather old or if they come even with a Linux kernel, let's say, uh, that's usually also quite dated uh, and not commonly maintained. And what this here is doing is it's taking a crate, so it's it's some library in, in a sense. In, in, in the Rust world, it's like a library, um, but it's always using the regular Rust tool chains for building things, right? So you don't have to have like virtual machine with an old release of Ubuntu or something um, to actually use this, but you can still use it with your current system. You know, you don't need to do anything weird or download, I don't know, Docker images or something. Um, yeah, so that is definitely a very, very nice way to go with. Um, and well, now here comes the nice part. If you have all of the below uh, stuff here, then now you can focus on making your application on top here. So you would just use the board support crate and then build your own application. Um, and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I have an example. So. Uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation made this um, microcontroller. It's uh, based on two ARM, I think, Cortex M0 cores or something. Um, and then they have their own uh, PIO. The uh, it's like a programmable IO. Uh, but, you know, they have like small state machines in them that you can just program yourself. Um, and all of that for a given board, and that given board is the RP2040, that's like a pre-packaged board, uh, all of that is already usable right away based on a board support crate. And so now what we're doing with the Orbit project is we're looking at a given main board, right? Let's say, um, for example, the uh, Vision 5 board that we currently have, and we don't have any of this here. So all we have is a microprocessor, or well, the SOC, uh, that's the physical part. We have it on a board somewhere. Um, we don't have a peripheral access crate, so we can't use it. Uh, I tried generating one from uh, device trees, but so far it hasn't worked out with the tool I tried. Um, but what we can do is we can still implement the hardware abstraction layer here, uh, here 
regardless of not having this peripheral access crate because this is just, you know, um, you don't really have to use it in order to implement a hardware abstraction layer. Hardware abstraction layer really just defines the methods uh, that you would need to supply and you can put anything in those methods. So technically you could also abuse it for uh, any, anything weird you can think of. You could just make up your own uh, system, right? And, you know, write an emulator based on uh, on this hell. Um, so yeah, uh, today uh, I want to look at um, the current state of the implementation that we have for the Vision 5 uh, and then see if we can implement this in a proper manner. So. Um, just for more context, so with the uh, Orbit project, we're also using uh, another crate, which is called Rust SBI. And SBI is from the RISC-V world again. It's called the Supervisor Binary Interface. And the Rust SBI implementation is actually also based on uh, embedded hell here, which was another reason <laughs> why I said, hey, let's also go with this. So yeah, I started implementing that. Um, and uh, before we uh, look at that, I want to uh, scroll down the page a bit further and see uh, what else we have here. So first of all, um, the traits they have defined are for these different peripherals here. And if you remember, this is also what we've been dealing with so far. So GPIOs, that's, I mean, for LEDs and so on, uh, but you can also use them for any arbitrary purpose, if you will. Uh, serial communication, that is something that we use quite a bunch because that's how we embed our code and so on, right? So if we, uh, uh, that's how we debug our code, right? So if we want to see if, um, I don't know, we made it uh, to a certain statement, we're in a given state or something, uh, we can just print to the serial console and see if we get the output that we actually wanted. Um, there is I squared C, a uh, very common bus. Uh, which we are not dealing with at this moment. There is SPI, the Serial Peripheral Interface, which is what we're dealing with. And that is for, uh, well, uh, in this instance here for the Vision 5, just for a tiny bit of setup. So um, there is a spy flash on the board, which has 16 megabytes of storage to offer. And this is where we actually put our firmware. And now for the Vision 5, it's a bit of a, a special thing. Um, it's actually different with uh, vendors <laughs> every time, you know, they have their own ideas of uh, how your system would start booting uh, and, you know, the, the specifics of it, actually. So what they do is um, they try to load something from the spy flash. Uh, if it has a given uh, first uh, few bytes that give it a length of what to load and then some code. So I'm, I'm not even sure if there is validation going on there, but I think it's really just loading the number of bytes written, uh, the number of, um, well, the number of bytes which are written in the first four bytes. So that's what we did last time here. Um, but then we need to do something else for whatever reason. Uh, we need to reprogram a register to say, hey, use this command for reading from the spy flash. And that is for setting up the memory map IO so that we just, can use the spy flash as if, if it, as if it were in memory, right? So we have a memory mapped spy flash then, um, which is really nice, right? So you can just jump to it and continue executing there uh, or just copy out from it without using a specific driver. Um, well, there's uh, timers, counters, uh, analog digital converters. Um, that's uh, a bunch of other uh, things we currently don't really care about too much. Uh, but we might actually need to look at something again later, but we will see. Um, and I think we're not going to get to that today anyway. Uh, but yeah, let's um, continue a bit here. So uh, for the HAL implementation, right, we have a bunch of interfaces or uh, traits that we need to implement, right? So this is what we also need to do uh, now for uh, for the Vision 5, I've already started this, uh, and we will need to uh, have another look at that again. So um, if you if you look at this here, they are also enumerating uh, the uh, different application and uh, use cases for uh, embedded health. For example, in Linux, there is something called sysfs. So if you look at your um, slash sys file system, and let's actually have a quick look again now. 
So we've done this before here, actually. Uh, there is something called sys. Um, let's let's say we look at sys class, uh, and let's say uh, backlight, for example, right? So this is where uh, I can now see um, the backlight of uh, of my uh, laptop's uh, screen here. So I can see what the current brightness is. This one here, brightness. So let's let's look at that. Uh, it says four five four zero zero. I don't know exactly what that means, but what I'm going to do now is I'm pressing a key on my laptop to lower the brightness, and now we see some other different number, right? So yeah, now I'm raising it again. So yeah, this is I guess the maximum uh four eight triple zero i don't really know what the number means exactly but yeah it's, it's not really my concern here um yeah i just wanted to uh, showcase this here so uh this is now a file that we can access in linux right but behind that file actually sits a driver as part of the linux kernel and that driver well is providing a layer which is abstracting the hardware and that's why, why they also explain this here to be uh, a sort of hell. So yeah, um, so much for that. And in the same fashion in Orboot, if we, uh, you know, if we have a, if we have a hell, let's say for serial, we can just always use the same methods for writing to serial. Um, usually, we would use the print macro for it. Right. So. Now the driver, um, they're explaining it a bit, you know, it's the uh, specifics underneath in the implementation um, and the application. I already described this anyway, so we don't need to look too much into this right now. Um, now this here is uh, quite a bunch of code actually. So uh, if you want, definitely go check this out. Uh, I will also put the link in the notes again. And they also uh, refer to different design patterns and so on. So maybe this is interesting if you're also into operating systems or uh, firmware implementation uh, in, in a bit of a different direction. Uh, there, there is a bunch of things to carve out here. So yeah, there is one chapter and this is the next chapter here in that book, uh, which talks about concurrency. And this is what we might actually need to get back to in a bit. So. Uh, well, just very briefly, what we're meaning uh, when we're talking about concurrency, we mean that um, you know, different processes, if you, know, if you have processes, or let's say different functions, uh, are trying to do something, in our case, with the same peripherals. Let's say we have two functions which are both trying to write to the serial port. Which one comes first, right? So, first of all, they shouldn't interfere. Uh, with each other and so in order to handle this um, the idea is that you would actually lock the access to a given peripheral so in this instance here um, let's see uh, this is a <laughs> this is a fun example uh, they're referring to global mutable data um, that's a bit of a different uh, use case for having this issue um, yeah, by looking at a typical example here a counter um, that is one thing uh, let's actually skip past that let's look at this here critical sections because this is also what you commonly find in uh, literature so what is a critical section a critical section is something um, that if you were to interfere with it somewhere in the middle um, you might actually run into problems and well there is a common thing, uh, the lock that I already described, uh, which we should also find in here now if we scroll a bit further, right? Atomic access. So atomic access actually means that um, you know when when you uh, when you do any of these operations here, um, you only enter the operation, you do everything in one shot, and then you leave it again. So it cannot happen that right in the middle. Uh, you know, you're doing something else and then you try to get back to this and well, the system may be messed up. So yeah, um, atomic, so the idea is, you know, just like uh, the, the model of an atom in physics, uh, you would have something that you cannot divide further in smaller pieces. 
regardless of whether atoms are actually really having that uh, uh, those properties now with uh, you know more modern uh, physics. Um, but yeah, that's the idea, right? So, uh, but that means that you would need to have special atomic instructions. So that is available for a bunch of platforms, uh, but not for all of the platforms that we have. Um, yeah, if, if you want, you can read up more about this here. Uh, and now there is uh, another few things here. Um, this one, abstraction, send and sync. Uh, this is for when you actually have concurrency already. Um, that is like uh, when, when you are in a multi-process environment, for example, or multi-thread environment. Well, it, it's mostly threads, I think. So this is for synchronizing threads. Um, and then there is this here. And this is what we will actually need to look into. Mutex is. So uh, what is Mutex? Mutex is mutual exclusive, right? Uh, and let's see what they write. We've created a use for abstraction specific to our counter problem, but there are many common abstractions used for concurrency. One such synchronization primitive is a Mutex, short for mutual exclusion. These constructs ensure exclusive access to a variable such as our counter, and in our case, behind the variables or whatever we have, uh, we would actually have our peripheral. So the whole point is that, you know, like in our serial example, for example, it cannot happen that we're trying to write or boot and write in the middle when we just wrote or, some, something else would also try to write something, let's say like hello, so it shouldn't happen that we see or hello boot or something, right? So that would be pretty messed up. So yeah, they uh, they have been thinking quite a lot about this and uh, they have come up with this here. Now I want to show you actually the code that I currently have and uh, the problem that I'm facing there. Um, and that's really mostly I think an implementation issue but we will figure this out. So first of all, uh, what do we currently have? So what we have is a re-implementation of the version 5 in Orboot. We just started over with it. Uh, I prepared a bunch of scripts like this one, uh, which we can actually use to flash to the device. And then we have the two serial devices attached. So I have two USB serial converters attached to the two headers that we have. The topmost one isn't really important any longer. So what we do is uh, very much early in the beginning, we switch over to the other one set a higher baud rate, and then we communicate here. So this is just um, from uh, a starting boot process and I just canceled it somewhere. I just turned off the device uh, after like a few milliseconds. Um, well, then what else do we have here? Uh, we have this TFTP home directory and up here we have a tool that is running that is serving TFTP and that's what we use to offer a Linux kernel to boot from. But that is actually not important to us today. So today we just want to see about this serial port. And I want to also look at the make file again for that. So the make file I wrote here um, also has this script run main board. Uh, well, we, we built the main board and then we just run. And what this here is doing is it is just writing uh, to the SRAM and then executing from there. So I will just turn on the board now and I will cancel the process that you see on the right. So now we see this here, right? The sci five logo. That means I just entered the bootloader mode. What I'm going to do is I will say make run and make run. It's going to build the board. It's waiting for me to press this button again. Now it's copying over uh, the Orboot binary and it's running it from SRAM. So what you saw on the right hand side here, load file OK, that was actually the response from this process here. And then you already saw it up uh, booting immediately here saying or boot, read from blah de blah. And this here is already outside of our code. So this is from the DRAM in it. Now let's look how this works. So I want to open two files. So the first one I have open here is this here, log.rs. And then the other one is main.rs. So main.rs being our main entry point. And if you look at this here, I'm not really doing much, right? So this here is where the main function starts. 
I'm initializing some clocks. Uh, I'm initializing a bunch of more stuff, which is specific to the board. Um, and now I am doing this here. This is now the interesting part. We're initializing the serial. And at some point we start writing to the serial. And this is how we do it currently. So I'm saying uh, I'm, I'm wrapping the serial in something called unsafe cell, whatever. And then I'm using serial.writefmt, the formatted write. And for that to work, I just pass on a format string. So this is um, essentially what the, um, what the uh, macros should then also support when, uh, when we implement them. So that would be this here. I actually want to be able to do this in, instead of that thing here. Now, what is this unsafe cell thing? Um, let's actually see if we find this here on this website because I have this uh, suspicion. Uh, and let's see that we get back to mutexes at some point. So let's see if we find cell ray. Actually, we have it right here. So uh, this here is doing something slightly different than I do. And I guess I might actually need to do this and it could work, but I don't know yet. So let's look again at our current code here. Um, and let's look at the right hand side. So the right hand side is uh, what I tried and what hadn't yet worked. So what I tried was I'm using this file here on the right log.rs and I'm saying set logger serial like this. Now this here is complaining um, because it says it has a different type and that is because I did this here. So instead we're not going to do this. So this serial was actually uh, this was actually shadowing. So yeah, the actual serial is coming from here. And this is now what we're handing over to the right hand side. And what we're going to do is we are going to say print hello. That's what we want to have. Now, will this work? Um, I could demonstrate this to you now. Uh, I will just say make run again. Uh oh, it's saying method not found in serial. Uh, hang on, write FMT and found for struct serial in the current scope. It's in line 158.14. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have another bunch of uh, prints here. So let's just do the following. Uh, for now, let's just comment out those other statements because they are not necessary right now anyway. Um, and there we go. We don't need this part here. Okay. So we say make run. I'm hitting buttons again so that it will be run. And we see, well, we see an L. Um, and this L down here, this L is actually coming from here. And that's this here. And what is happening is, um, I'm trying to acquire a lock here and that doesn't really work. So we're, we're using this here. There is a crate called spin and from spin, I'm using a mutex. I'm using something called once and that doesn't seem to work right now. So yeah, that was my first attempt and that was what I copied over from uh, the Norja board. So with a Norja that actually works. Uh, but for some reason here, it doesn't. And my suspicion is that it has to do with the underlying instructions. So um, how do we actually figure out what the instructions are? Well, uh, let's say uh, make opstump this, this year. And with make opstump, we can then see if we actually uh, get what we need. So uh, let's, uh, let's go to this directory again. Let's say make opstump type it into less. Now let's search for uh, the function that we actually need to call. So um, we're saying set logger, right? 
and that set logger function uh, doesn't seem to be in here. No, why is that the case actually? Um, huh. Oh, huh. see, because we're inlining this here. Um, let's maybe not inline this for now. Let's not inline the set logger function. Um, Uh, and let's let's actually run this again just to see if there is any difference. No, there shouldn't be actually. It shouldn't have anything to do with the inlining. So what the inlining really does is, uh, and, and you see it isn't different. We still just see the L. Just ignore this add here. That is really just from setting up this report, uh, just like this junk here sometimes. So what the um, inlining really does is it's uh, it's just putting everything uh, in like, well, <laughs> inlining is actually self-explanatory in a way. So in, instead of having a separate function um, after compilation, actually everything is, is put in uh, it just inside of where it is used. So yeah, it might be a bit less or more efficient depending on what exactly you do. So yeah, and, and this instance here is actually uh, quite okay. So let's search for a set logger now. Uh oh, I don't see it actually. Now why is that? Hmm, good question. Okay, then let's do something different. Uh, let's say we search for, what can we search for? So let's actually go a bit like instruction by instruction. So set logger comes, comes after gmac init, right? So do we have gmac init here? Well, we should, uh, but we don't. Huh. Are we looking at the right file here anyway? So there should be a main function somewhere. And we should be able to find the main function. Uh, we have start. We have this start. So this is our assembly entry point. And that at, at some point there should be a jump this year. This is jumping to our main function. And now we should be able to search for that thing. There we go. And now we should see a bunch of things happening like, well, it, it can be a bit lengthy. It might be that a bunch of things were unrolled here. So yeah, here we can actually see the first UART write. UART write, oh, and here we go. This is about the logger. So uh, this is saying log logger. And that is exactly what we should see here this year. It's probably this. Um, I mean, it's, it's after the UART write. So the first UART write would be this year. So we're now in the inline set logger function, right? Yeah, that's what we are. So let's see what actually happens here. Um, so we see the UART write. We, we see output from the UART write. Uh, and then we should get to this instruction. But this here is a, this here is a jump. It's a jump. It's not a... Interesting. I would ex have expected a call instead of a jump here. Um, but yeah, I mean, it does work, I guess. I don't know. I guess it's also an, no. I'm not sure how much is actually being inlined when you write inline at some point, if it also inlines everything underneath. I wouldn't expect that right away. Um, anyway, so what we actually want to debug here is, uh, we want to debug whether uh, we actually somehow make it into uh, this thing here. So, yeah, I, I don't have any print statement uh, or, or UART right at this point here, right? So let's actually do this. So I want to see if this uh, function is being called. Uh, so let's just put another UART right in here. And let it say, I don't know, C, because we have this call thing here. Um, 
Now let's say make. And now we look at the orb stump again. Uh, let's go to that thing again here. Right, so uh, I just added another uh, UART, right? Do we have another UART, right? Um, we have this one. Do we have another one? I wonder. Huh, it's interesting. Well, We do have two of them here. Uh, I can imagine this here actually being the uh, match block here. That would make sense. Um, let's see. So that is under this label. Let's okay. Let's actually do the following. Let's. Let's uninline this again. Uh, and let's also uninline this here. Now, I don't know if that's enough or if it doesn't have any effect. So, yeah, let's say make mainboard op jump and search for this again. Uh, it doesn't look too different. It can also be that Rust is already deciding to inline a few things but just because it's uh, a bit easier to do at this point. So yeah, um, we need to figure out where we are actually because I'm, I'm kind of getting lost here. So I'm, I'm very sure this here is a UART write and what is actually being written to it uh, is this here, right? So the first argument uh, a0 being the argument register. The first argument is 76, right? So if we uh, if we look at the hex value for 76, that is for C. Uh, doesn't really help, right? Does it? Um, 41 is A, right? So for C would be like the 12 character, whatever. Um, let's just Let's just look at the uh, ASCII table. So decimal 76, decimal 76 is uh, here, L. So that's the L character being written here. So this here is loading the L character to the argument register, zero, and then it's just outputting it um, by doing this jump here. And then it should actually return back at some point. Um, now let's see what uh, what else is being loaded to this register before calling this function. So we have this code here, which is also writing to um, to the serial, and it's uh, loading uh, the C character here. That's this here. So this is what I just added, right? So the C character. Um, it's not part of the function, but what you can actually see is there is a bunch more going on before this. Um, at least that's how Rust is compiling it, right? And if you look closely, you see that there is also a bunch of branching going on. So there is a bunch of branch if not equal to zero here, uh, those things. And only then uh, if uh, those branches are not hit, uh, we would actually make it to this point where we would write the C character. So I want to see uh, what other instructions we have here, um, which might get us into a weird state or something. So there's something called sc.w. Um, that looks interesting. I'm not exactly sure what that is. There is sx.w. I don't know what that is. Um, I could imagine W to be something like right, but I'm not sure. Uh, there is this here, lr.w.aq. So this could be like a lock something, a choir. 
Let's actually look at that in the uh, instruction set for risk five. So uh, I expect it to, uh, to show up somewhere here. Oh, look. So we have LR dot W this year, load reserved store conditional instructions. Okay, that is interesting. Um, we had LR dot W dot AQ, but uh, I couldn't actually find that in here. Do we find something dot AQ here? Oh, look. Oh. Okay, let's zoom in here a bit. So, um, it says RRL, I guess that is for release, and AQ for acquire. Um, okay, what else do we have here? Oh, we also have the fence instruction here. Uh, Quite a bunch to read, actually. Do they explain those abbreviations? It would be very helpful. Let's see again. So we had this AQ, right? So software should not set the RL bit on an RL LR instruction, okay, RL bit on the LR instruction, unless the AQ bit is also set, nor should software set the AQ bit on an SC instruction unless the RL bit is also set. Okay, great. Um, atomic memory instructions, okay. Oh, you know what? I actually have a, I have a little suspicion right now. Um, let's actually see what instructions the JH seven one hundred, which is a, what was it? F U seven U seven forty, U seventy four. What it actually supports? So, if I remember correctly, it supports the I M A F D C. Uh, instructions and C would be for compressed instructions. Um, I, I was having the suspicion that maybe this year is a compressed instruction, the lr.w.iq. Um, I'm not too sure. So, oh, hang on, with what we've just read, uh, I would actually like to see if we also have a release somewhere. Do we have some .rl somewhere? Let's, let's have a look at that. Uh, dot rl and we do uh, I don't know where oh that's in some debug code okay that is in in far different places okay let's get back to this here um, then let's have a look if we only have okay actually have two of those instructions that uh, that's also interesting so this is in log print ah underscore print right and then the second instance is in uh whatever this is something aligned now that i'm thinking of it we can actually also say was it no was it no mangle or no inline no mangle is that like the opposite of inline no mangle let's see what comes out of it huh still looks the same I don't know. No, let's just keep it as it was. 
So yeah, anyway, um, yeah, well, I want to see what this AQ actually really does. So if it's just acquiring a lock and then just, I don't know, going nuts, it doesn't really help us, right? So yeah, and I wanted to see if the U74 actually supports those instructions, but it, I mean, it should. Uh, U74. Oh, we cannot find that part. What do we have here, though? Do we have something on Udixis or something? Um, instructions, support instructions or something? Yeah. Um, I don't see it, actually. Controls, custom instructions. Oh, go this mode. mode. Huh. Okay. Base instruction formats. That's great. So. These are the different instruction types. Okay. Mm. Let's unfold this actually. There is a bunch more in there. So, right. The C extension is available. The D extension is available. The F extension is available. A, M. And the base insertion, so that would be the I. Okay, well, that looks that looks actually very good. So yeah, I just wanted to confirm that we can actually uh, use all of those instructions. Mm. Yeah, about the atomic memory instructions or operations here, AMO. Um, I actually don't know much about it, to be honest. I would still need to read up on that. Um, yeah. Oh, let's see. Here is an actual explanation. An SC instruction can never be observed by another RISC-V heart before the immediately preceding LR. Due to the atomic nature of the LR and the C sequence, no memory operations from another heart can be observed to have occurred between the LR and a successful SC. The LRC sequence can be given acquire semantics by setting the AQ bit, this year, on the LR instruction. So this year is setting the AQ bit on the LR instruction then, I guess. And in turn, the LRSC sequence can be given release semantics by setting the RL bit on the SC instruction, which makes sense. Setting the AQ bit on the LR instruction and setting both the AQ and the RL bit on the SC instruction makes the LRSC sequence sequentially consistent. What a, what a mouthful. <laughs> Meaning that it cannot be reordered with earlier or later memory operations from the same heart. Okay, good. I mean, that, that's exactly what we want, right? So we want atomicity, and for atomicity, we want to have this atomic nature as described here, where other hearts cannot interfere with your current heart, which is good. So if, if you recall, we actually have two hearts on the U74. Um, yeah. What else? So now, the way we're currently doing this doesn't really work and it's really just uh, code copied over from somewhere else where uh, I don't actually fully understand it either. So let's take a look at this here for comparison. So let me just um, copy this code here. So this here is now about sending interrupts, but I don't care about interrupts. Um, I want to have this here, this Munich thing, 
uh, but I cannot use it from Cortex M interrupt mutex. I would need to use something else. And uh, there's something else. That's actually what we do have here already. Uh, we have the spin mutex. So can we do this here and use core cell? Uh, Well, let's change this into logger. And actually apply the same pattern as before. Just that this year, uh, we're going to comment this out now instead. So now that we have this uh, other sort of uh, mutex thing. Um, we cannot use this uh, call once here. So call once is actually coming from uh, this once thing here. So where we say once log logger. So instead, what we're now going to do is we need to do something with mutex. Um, now, we need to adjust the cell U32 thing to being logged logger. And what is log logger? Well, it is this here. Now, of course, we cannot say uh, huh, okay, this is now a bit of an issue. Um, cell only works if we actually pass it a value. So what can we do for creating log logger? Um, yeah, we're not, we're, we're not actively using it here. So we're just passing something called serial. We say set logger and in set logger, you know, uh, this is where we pass on the mutex that is coming from here. And uh, well, what we could now do is we, we could make this an option. So uh, we could make this a cell, which gets an option of either a logger uh, or nothing, whatever it's called again in Rust. Um, yeah, uh, that doesn't feel too pleasant either, to be honest. Okay, so let's let's think about it. So we we have this um, we have this core cell thing here. Uh, there is also something else called um, unsafe cell. This here. Uh, let's maybe instead of using unsafe cell. Um, Let's see if we can use cell. I don't know. Uh, we're actually just using this here for um, for wrapping the serial. Uh, yeah. How do we do this here? And that's why you don't copy code blindly from st uh, st uh, Stack Overflow or something, by the way. Because stack overflow code is not from your code base, so it doesn't really apply. Just like this here. It's from very, very similar places in the same code base, but apparently it doesn't apply one to one here. Um, I'm actually asking myself where, where I took this year from. Because it's uh, something interesting. Okay, so let's do the following. Let's go to the other board directory. Uh, Let's go to the Orboot D1 implementation. So I will go to this directory here. And then let's see at BT0 source uh, main. Let's see here um, how we're passing down the serial to the logger. So we have this mod here called logging. 
And by the way, just if you're wondering, we're not even yet in embedded hell. Uh, or let's say we're actually past that. So we're now trying to pass this embedded hell thing to uh, this logger thing that we create ourselves. So yeah, we're just doing this here. Oh, now I remember, I actually copied the other part from the main subdirectory. And in here, we're also using unsafe cell, unsafe cell this year. So yeah. Um, yeah, this is a wrapping struct. It's called cereal, like the cereal you have, have for breakfast, just for the fun of it. Anyway, um, yeah, we wanted to do the very same thing here, but it just didn't work for some reason. Uh, well, doing that thing worked, right? So if I did this here on the left hand side, that worked. Um, but then I didn't really have the macros. So here, however, we do have the macros. And we have that because um, we're actually using them from REST SBI. So we're passing on the, uh, you see this here, init legacy std IO. This is where we pass the serial uh, down to REST SBI. And then REST SBI gives us the, um, print macro. We could technically also do the same, uh, but we actually don't intend to use Rust SBI already at that stage, so we want to use it later. Um, yeah. To be honest, it's uh, become a bit messy here already. So yeah, this is now, uh, just for reference, this is the Nordjar code. So on the left-hand side is the main stage, and on the right-hand side is the uh, boot zero stage, the first stage that we also are currently working on for the um, version five. Oh well. Yeah, I guess I will have to cut it here anyway. Um, as I told you, I'm having a sore throat. I can uh, feel it all the time actually. So yeah, let's let's do that. Um, let's continue uh, again next week. So yeah, anyway. Um, Thank you for uh, coming by and uh, take care everyone and see you next week. Bye.